I'm Jacob. I'm going to talk about the evolution of the blob storage platform at Meta over the last seven or eight years, with a particular focus on one new system we built called Manifold. My story has three parts. I'll start by talking about the decision to build Manifold. Prior to building a new system, we typically try to reuse or evolve existing solutions, sometimes stretching them far beyond what they were originally designed to do. That strategy was effective for years prior to Manifold, so it's worth looking at what changed. Next, I'll give a really simple sketch of Manifold, and that will set up the third part of the story, which is the journey, where I'll talk about how Manifold evolved over the years, starting with the production MVP, evolution to its current form, and where it's going next. So for background, let's roll back to 2014 or so. If you had a storage problem at Meta, or Facebook at the time, these were your options. One of several single data center cluster file systems, or Everstore, the geo-replicated blob store. Let's look a bit closer at these. You're probably familiar with the cluster file systems, HDFS, Gloucester, etc. You can choose from a few, depending on your needs. Generally, they all work pretty well for sequential I.O. on somewhat large files within a single data center. As for limitations, the most obvious problem is that these clusters can only get so big. Scaling beyond one often requires software changes, because now your logical namespace is broken up in some way. Scaling beyond a handful of clusters introduces progressively more operational overhead. This problem was clear a decade ago, which is why we started working on Tectonic in 2014. With Tectonic, one cluster can serve a whole building, and with the right network, potentially a whole region. Since its production deployment in 2016, scale has not been a main concern with this model. The bigger problem is that in most cases, this is an incomplete solution. Or alternatively, you might say these systems are just too low level for most applications. For example, disaster recovery, what happens when a region goes offline, and other things, gearing, archival. Plenty of common storage features are just not available at this level. Single region file systems are a low level concept and we usually don't want application workloads depending on them directly. And this may seem obvious now, but for a long time, this is exactly what applications did. Hundreds of workloads were interacting with these cluster file systems directly, but requirements evolve. For example, today it's a baseline expectation that services will survive a region outage. We take that for granted now, but it wasn't the expectation a decade ago. Similarly, the company has grown. When you have a handful of teams relying on storage, it's okay if storage is slightly hard to use, or some features are missing, and that creates some complexity for developers. But when you have thousands of software teams building on storage, it pays to keep things simple. Well, there's good news. Everstore solves some of these problems. It's multi-region, available, and scalable. It transparently rebalances capacity across regions, archives data by default, etc. On top of these capabilities, Everstore is designed to integrate with the social graph, so it's quite easy for product engineers to use. The social graph is supported by a highly available scale-out graph database called Tau. This is the system that stores comments, posts, friendships, pretty much the entire data model for Facebook and Instagram. If you're interested, the paper on Tau is easy to find online. Everstore was originally built to enable photo and video sharing, which is a social feature built on Tau. So when Everstore was built, Tau was an obvious place to stick metadata. So at the storage layer, Everstore metadata is really simple. Unlike something like S3, which lets you associate a name with whatever blob you're storing, Everstore storage layer just accepts whatever data you give it and returns a handle, which is just an opaque string, which you're meant to stuff into Tau somewhere. Later, to read or delete the data, you need the handle. From the perspective of implementing a storage system, this is simplifying. You don't need to build a namespace. A lot of internal workloads rely on Everstore. It works well. People do this even if the data they're storing is completely disconnected from what we would think of as the social graph. For example, a simple command line tool might store stack traces this way, in some disconnected island of the graph. So how far can we go with this? What are the limits? Well, one is that Tau comes with some limitations. Maybe it's not the consistency or availability model you want. Maybe your query pattern isn't friendly to the way Tau shards data. That's actually OK, too. You can bypass Tau and just use the raw, lower level Everstore API. But if you do that, you have to store all those handles somewhere. Otherwise, you won't know how to get your data back out of Everstore. So teams are building their own metadata systems on top of Everstore. And this is great in a way. We're continuing to stretch existing systems to solve new problems. But there are drawbacks too. One is that the problem is harder than it looks. For example, maintaining consistency. You might have written data to Everstore, but somehow failed to store the handle. Now that Everstore data is orphaned, how do you discover it and delete it? Because these systems are standardized, it's hard to build a general solution to reconcile Everstore references. And surprisingly, that wasn't just an Everstore thing. 
Even though cluster file systems support directories and names, we saw similar solutions built on top of that to solve for other problems, like replication or tiering or secondary indexing or something else. When we looked, we found a dozen or so systems like this. That may not seem like a lot, but building and maintaining a system like this at scale isn't cheap, so that figure has a lot of bias built in, where the workload justified the expense. So this points to a pretty big gap in terms of what the storage platforms are providing. These aren't what we would call head workloads, like photos or video. Everstore is effectively custom built for those. And we're not talking about tail workloads like the stack traces I mentioned. Pretty much anything would work for those. We're talking about these torso workloads, just below the head, things like model distribution, checkpointing, etc. So looking at these workloads helps surface some of the capability gaps in storage. And that leads us finally to the vision. Closing those gaps. Here I'm showing capabilities as solid boxes and capability gaps as empty boxes. Prior to Manifold, customers had to fill the gaps themselves. And our goal with Manifold is to uplevel the storage abstraction a bit so we can internalize that complexity and solve it generally within the storage platform and simplify the application layer. And by the way, when I say application layer, I mean that very broadly. I mean any workload using storage. It could be storing program binaries, log files, photos, feature data, whatever. So that's the vision, a new abstraction for storage. But we're not quite done. Before we commit to building a new system, we have to figure out how that choice will impact the evolution of other systems, particularly those that until now we've been stretching in every possible direction. So one obvious question is, why not just add these features to Tectonic? Tectonic is scalable, and it has an industry standard API, HDFS, so why limit it to a single region? There are good arguments on either side of this. If you're smart about how you encode data across regions, you can get a lot more theoretical durability than if you do it naively at a higher layer. But one of the pivotal arguments against this, at least for us, at least for now, is complexity. We often talk about DR as the thing that protects us against natural disasters, but just as important is that it protects us from software failures. If there's some narrow set of conditions that causes Tectonic to lose data in one region, we hope to at least minimize correlation of those conditions across deployments. And so this geo-replication archival layer is a line of defense against software failures too. So we want that layer to be as reliable as possible, simple and easy to reason about. It shouldn't do more than it has to. In fact, we were just around this time starting to focus on making Everstore more modular. Historically, Everstore handled everything from the storage node, to geo-replication archival and routing, to integration with Tau. There was a lot of monolithic complexity, and it was a struggle operationally. So by 2016, we were pivoting Everstore to sit on top of Tectonic, which proved to be a huge improvement operationally, and for reliability. So introducing a new system, Manifold, to focus on the semantic layer, was in line with our vision of creating a more modular storage stack. And with respect to Everstore, this is about more than simplification. Remember all those scenarios I mentioned earlier that were relying on cluster file systems directly, some with their own replication functionality on top. We wanted to eventually move all of those to Manifold, which would rely on Everstore for replication and archival. Everstore was about to see an explosion of workload diversity, and so we were significantly raising the bar in performance, availability, and generality it would become an almost completely new system. Okay, let's look at Manifold. The Manifold API should be familiar to anyone who's used S3. Buckets, keys, and values. Everyone understands those. We don't need to invent a new concept unless there's a good reason. So let's focus on where we chose to deviate. As I said, we care about simplicity. We want to stop pushing complexity to the application layer. And to that end, we decided to support strong consistency. So what that means is that you get read after write consistency by default globally. You can relax that, but that's the default. And every mutation is atomic, and this includes common higher order mutation patterns like concatenate, append, and truncate. In a similar vein, we support predicate-based mutation, such as only perform this update if some property of the blob has a given value. This makes it easier to guard against race conditions in application logic, particularly retry logic. And we also have this idea that decisions should be reversible whenever possible. This is related to simplicity. Often when designing your storage layer, you have to make various decisions, like should this data live on flash or disk, single region or multi-region, what is my access pattern across keys? We believe such decisions should be late binding whenever possible. For example, one of the patterns you may have seen using cloud storage or even systems like HBase is that if you have a hot key range, you may need to add some kind of prefix to your keys to distribute the metadata or load across shards. So the sharding behavior of the underlying system leaks into the application data model. We wanted to avoid that. So we support directories as a first-class concept. We can reshard at directory granularity without the application having to do anything. 
without any semantic change to the format of the keys. As for implementation, there are three separate pieces. Manifold is a stateless service that can run anywhere. It relies on external services to persist data and metadata. For metadata, we use a service that exposes a bunch of replicated reliable RocksDB instances, which we'll call shards. These shards max out around 10 or 20 gigabytes, so buckets typically span lots of shards. And we can configure shards to have different constraints on how they place replicas. So across the half million or so shards that we manage, there are a few dozen different configurations. So the bottom layer of Manifold is just managing placement of data across these shards, migrating data as necessary while maintaining availability. And then we have the blob module, which abstracts blob payload storage. I mentioned before how we can chain blobs together to create bigger blobs. That happens here. Everything at this layer is immutable. Copies are by reference. This layer also has an offline module that checks references, finds orphan data, garbage, and finds potentially lost data, dangling references, and checks durability. Our metadata layer doesn't give us a transaction domain for the whole bucket, so we rely on right ordering to maintain consistency. Partial failures can create orphan data, so these async processes that clean that up are important. Encryption also happens here, so any data by the time it gets to Everstore or a lower level storage system is already encrypted. And finally, the semantic layer exposes the API we want, on top of everything else. This is where privacy and security checks happen. This is where internal schema for things like blobs and directories is defined. And this is where path breaking happens. So that's a very high level snapshot, but each of these layers is evolving. So let's look at where we started, where we are now, and where we're going. Six months after coding started, we were shadowing a couple of these big torso workloads and supporting a couple others that were still in development. Six months after that, we were in prod. So going from zero to prod inside a year, especially on these demanding workloads, implies some pretty ruthless prioritization. These Torso workloads were demanding, great test cases for the system early on. And because this work was impactful, the teams were willing to work with us. That's a great characteristic to have in your early adopters. We could instead have targeted tail workloads early on, but we didn't think we'd learn as much or get as much help. So some of the corners we cut. On the metadata side, initially we supported only one directory, and that directory was pre-split to its maximum number of shards. It was simple, but it worked. Our first production workload put tens of billions of files in that directory. And when the following year we enabled creating additional directories, all those workloads just kept working. The evolution was non-breaking. On the blob side, we only supported put, get, and delete. No object composition, like in cat or append. We had no offline module, so no garbage collection. It somehow still seems strange to me that we went to production without garbage detection and durability monitoring, but we did. And that shows how far we've come. At the time, almost every torso system had this gap. So this wasn't a regression. The fact that with Manifold we had a path to fixing it was, in fact, a step forward. But the bar's gone up so fast in the last few years, it's hard to imagine going back. And I should call out, there were places we didn't cut corners. We supported end-to-end -end checksumming from day one. The API requires that clients use it. And at that time, that was novel. So in this case, we raised the bar. And we did that because we thought it was important. And as an aside, this feature caught a lot of misbehavior in different systems over the years. Even though we were replacing some custom-built systems, we still got some huge wins in that first year. How? It's not because our software was better. Here's an example. This workload onboarded to Manifold in 2018. Previously, this customer had a large, dedicated Gluster deployment, tens of petabytes. Gluster was I.O. bound on this workload to the point that only about 20% of the storage was usable. 80% of the storage capacity was stranded. It would have been worse if not for a large adjacent MySQL on Flash deployment, where all the small data, anything less than a megabyte, was being written. But Flash is not the most efficient way of storing one megabyte blobs. So utilization was poor. If we could have mixed this very hot data with a bunch of relatively cold data, the average I.O. temperature would have been fine. And that's exactly what moving to Manifold enabled. Manifold routed almost all of the data to Everstore, which had more than enough spare IOPS to soak up the load. So this was effectively a 5x efficiency bump. We reclaimed that stranded storage, as well as the bulk of the Flash. But that's not even all. Because Everstore is so much bigger than Gluster, there's substantially more capacity to burst. So when the system needs to burst, it has about 10x more throughput than it used to. So customer scenarios that depend on burst capacity are 10x faster. And still that's not all. The fact that Everstore supports synchronous geo-replication meant that this customer was able to completely change the way they did region failover, cluster upgrades, etc. I like this story because we anticipated the first two wins, utilization and burst throughput, but the later ones were a complete surprise. 
So this back and forth process of just raising the bar back and forth between systems and seeing where it can go next, that really shows the value of what we're trying to do. So we went to production toward the end of 2017. And basically for the next two years, we added all those missing features and worked our way through the torso storage scenarios one or two at a time. And after about two or three years, the core features were mostly there and the focus changed. You start focusing less on building and more on integration, plugging into the rest of the infra ecosystem, enabling teams to build middleware, plugins for things like caching and distribution. At the same time, we started focusing more on refinement, thinking about the long tail, what it means to have thousands of customers, improving tools and documentation, and thinking about those last few torso workloads that were harder than the rest for whatever reason, pushing some requirements down to the systems we depend on. And this is where we are now. This is meant to show the distribution of workloads, with the head on the left and the tail on the right. This is a made-up chart. There are more workloads than this, but this should give an approximation of where we are with adoption in percentage terms. Another note on this diagram, I haven't specified the y-axis. If we were a storage company, the y-axis would probably be something like revenue per customer. But at Meta, our customers are our partners. So in our case, the y-axis is more a measure of how much time we spend thinking about them. If they're using a ton of storage, sure, we'll be thinking about them. But even if they're not, if they're just important to the business or just have a really hard problem to solve, that'll also push them to the left. So anyway, why isn't the head using Manifold? The head workloads are the ones that Everstore and Tectonic were custom built for. There's little we can do strictly within Manifold to improve on these. Targeting them requires a coordinated evolution across systems, which is where we're going next. So here's that diagram I showed earlier. On the left is where we were in 2016, on the right is where we wanted to go, and in the middle is where we are now. Everstore I.O. characteristics are fine for serving media to users on the internet. The internet is pretty slow. But it's not great for latency-sensitive or high-throughput workloads. Fixing this requires a pretty big shift, which is underway now. But until that happens, the only way for Manifold to get really good I.O. behavior is by bypassing Everstore, which is not ideal. And in a similar vein, we still need more control over how Everstore replicates data. So this is work in progress, and it involves changing the interface between Manifold and Everstore, so it really has to be done in concert across both systems. And in the context of that diagram I showed earlier, here's what optimizing the I.O. path looks like from the Manifold side. Our blob module assumes that blobs are immutable, which is fine, but we need to faster path for incoming writes. Our goal is for I.O. to Manifold to be as efficient as I.O. on Tectonic. And once we get there, we'll really have made the placement of data late binding for every workload. The other thing that's evolving is metadata. The Manifold metadata layer has to abstract migration and sharding. It's complicated. On top of that, the way these rocks instances replicate, the latencies can be kind of unpredictable, and availability is not quite what we would like. So we're going to migrate to a new, modern database platform. It's already in production on some other workloads, not really at the scale we want for Manifold, but getting there. And this new DB will give us a single, consistent transaction domain for the whole bucket. That's going to simplify Manifold across the board. So that's our story. For a long time, it made sense to stretch our existing systems rather than building something new. And what changed was that the bar was raised on things like availability, scale, efficiency, and ease of use. Once we decided to build Manifold, our approach was incremental and evolutionary. But realizing the full vision of Manifold depends on and enables a much broader reconfiguration of storage. Thank you.